Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. It's good to see you all this morning at the beginning of the month, which uh, this is. It's hard to believe it's August already. Uh, um, summer is uh, passing um, as we, we look at things here. And as somebody who has lived my life, I've never gotten out of school. I've always been in school my whole life. So I've gone to school, and now I teach uh, in college. My, my calendar runs by the school calendar, and um, I'm getting around to, at the end of this week, I have to go back to school. So I'm in a little bit of the grieving phase, as all, are all the other uh, people here that are heading back to school this fall. I am thankful that we are heading back to school. I'm thankful that so far we're going to head back to school without face coverings and things like that at Cedarville. I hope that'll be the case, generally speaking. But uh, last year we were able to go through this, the year but had a lot of people who uh, were remote, and I had um, students all masked up in my classrooms, and I did not enjoy that at all. Uh, so I hope that that will not be the case this time. Uh, this last week was just really a fun week. Uh, I had the privilege of being a part uh, of the VBS, and it was just fun. Uh, I enjoyed getting to know some new kids and some kids that I knew a lot better, uh, and we just had a lot of fun together, a lot of laughter uh, and uh, I just so encouraged to see uh, kids hear about Jesus' love for them. Uh, and I don't know if you know, but uh, I think uh, maybe uh, uh, Tabitha mentioned this, but it culminated on Thursday night where we hosted a meal here and had uh, the parents come in with their kids uh, and sat down together. And I got to know a, a number of families that were of the families of the kids who were coming. Uh, and that was just a sweet thing. Got to meet them and talk with them a little bit and tell them a little bit about my experience of their child over the week. I always only told the good things that happened over the week. Uh, but no, most of it was just really, really fun. Uh, and got to see just people in, enjoying Jesus, enjoying sharing Jesus, uh, living that out. And let me, one of the other sidelights of that uh, is that, um, and I'm, I'm backing up my wife's appeal for blast, we just had a, a ton of volunteers uh, and it was, it was fun. We just, we worked well together. Uh, we had people doing all kinds of things. Even Rick Hilliard was here doing security. Uh, we didn't need it, and, and he, I don't think he did anything, but he was here, uh, and it was really good right while he's there, but we had, we had a great time uh, doing those things, but I'm telling you, that was one of the, the real side, uh, real wonderful things that was just a, a part of that week. I just enjoyed being with my brothers and sisters, and praying together, uh, thinking together about how to love these kids. And so I, I hope you'll, you'll take this opportunity to work in BLAST. Uh, and when you think about the potential, um, sometimes as a church, I was uh, reading this week, I'm reading a little book on the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, and uh, just being reminded that God gives us life as a gift and we're to receive it and to make the most of it and not to live in the future as if it's going to be better uh, just around the corner. Uh, and often that uh, as a church can, can make us such that we don't think about the inestimable value of the person sitting next to me or of the kid in the nursery. And that God has allowed us to love each other and be together uh, and he wants to bring people to himself and grow them in Christ. And so I hope you'll do that, take it, the opportunity to be invested uh, on Wednesday evening. It's always much more enjoyable to work with kids when you're not the only one managing 30 of them, right? It's, it's so when you're there and you've got team members that are working with you, right? I had, I see Marie Harmon was in my team, and so it was Angie Harmon. She was in there too, uh, and we had Emily Ruffner, uh, and I'm forgetting someone. Who did I, who'd I forget? Who? Kara. Oh, Tara Gilhood. Sorry. Sorry. I was trying to think. I don't remember any Kara in my group. Right. So I was going to take their word for it, but I misheard. Sorry. No. So they were all there, and so I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. Well, I want to direct your attention uh, to the little book of Titus is where we've been, and we're preparing for our communion today. Uh, and this is a great passage uh, that happens to be in our series uh, but also falls on this day, and it's the end of, of Titus chapter 2. And uh, in this uh, last couple months, we've just been in this little book of Titus, this little book that Paul writes to one of his protégés, and he's in a difficult situation. Uh, there are believers here 
uh, but they're a scattered group of believers. They're not really organized into a body of believers. Uh, and Paul is concerned about them. They're vulnerable. Uh, and they live in a culture that's really a dark place. Uh, Paul quotes one of their own poets about the culture in which they live. Uh, and he says that Cretans have a liar, and this is one of their, uh, uh, Cretans have a reputation by one of their own poets to say that they're liars. They were people who were renowned in the ancient world for not speaking the truth because they were busy trying to rip people off as people floated into their island in the middle of the Mediterranean. Uh, they were like the uh, last gas station, you know, before you cross the desert. And so they would rip people off, and they had a reputation for being liars. They had a reputation for being people who were lazy, that they weren't people who produced things. They were just people who handed off material to other people who came. And so they were not known for being productive or engaged. There was a lot of drunkenness on the island of Crete. Matter of fact, one of the startling things, if you remember Steve's uh, message, is that he speaks to the older women and tells them not to be drunkards, which is kind of interesting, right? Right? Uh, those kinds of things. And also, they were known for all kinds of sexual debauchery. Uh, matter of fact, they were known for behaving like animals. Right? So this is a dark place. Titus has a young group of believers. He's sent there by Paul to put them in order. And as we look through the book, right, he gives us uh, a set of things that he wants them to do. And it also gives us a perspective from Paul about what a healthy church looks like. And so if you're going to have a church up and running, if you're going to have a church that's, that's able to go on God's mission together and to grow each other, right, you need a healthy church. And so Paul says you need these things in place if you're going to have a healthy church. So uh, we've kind of come away from Titus's, the instructions that Paul has given to Titus to say, well, what are the things that Paul sees that should be a part of a healthy church? And so we've kind of listed them in terms of questions here. Whoops, I went forward myself, that's my bad. Um, if we were evaluating EBC's health, right, or if we were looking from Paul's perspective about what would be a healthy church, Paul would encourage us to ask these questions. And so as we work through the, group, the book of Titus, uh, the first thing that he wants to say is, what's our governing authority? And he starts off there at the beginning and says, well, it should be God's word. What God has done, is doing, and will do in Christ Jesus is what explains our very existence and should shape the way we behave and live and the way we understand ourselves. So we need to get clear about what our authority is. Our authority is in our culture. It is in our feelings. It is in our spouse or our husband, right? It's, it's God and his word is the authority that should structure it. Well, then the next thing is, well, what are those that the church believes should be qualified to lead? So the very first chapter is all about the right kind of leaders that should be people who are leading God's people if it's a healthy church. And they're people who are stewards. And stewards are not people who have ownership over the church. They're people who are taking care of the church in accordance with the desires of the person who is the owner of the church, which is God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the ones who gave birth to this very group of people. They're the ones who have brought them life and are going to bring them ultimately to home. And so if you have a pastor who is the right kind of pastor, he's a steward who's taking care of the people of God in accordance with God's desires for them. So a very, very important thing. And then we moved into chapter 2, and he's going to talk about, well, if you see a healthy church, what kind of relationship should you see in this church? How should you see men and women behaving in relationship to each other? How should men and women be thinking about themselves? What's the relationship between the young and the old people? How do they relate to each other? What's the relationship between the young people? How do people who are under authority respond to people who are in authority? And how do authorities respond to those who are under authority? All those kinds of things he's going to go after. And Paul wants to say that these are important because the way we live as the people of God, as a family, is a part of our witness. It's not only good for our health and our blessing, but we should be a picture in the way we relate to each other of what God is trying to do as he brings us to life. So you should see men and women treating one another in ways that are shaped by the gospel. And so he wants to talk about that. So our lives, and he uses the imagery, our lives should adorn the truth about what God has done in Christ to save and deliver us. So the way I treat my wife should adorn the gospel. It should demonstrate a husband who is giving his life for his wife so that she might come to know Christ and grow in him, right? 
I'm not someone who abuses her or uses her or demeans her in any way. And as she responds to me, to use Paul's language in another passage from Ephesians 5, she responds to me as someone who is loving her to Christ as Christ, right? And we work together in complementary harmony, right? That's what we should see. Not a husband trying to abuse his wife, not a wife trying to manipulate her husband. Not those kinds of things should be apart because our lives, our marriages, our relationships should adorn the gospel. Well, today... We're going to dig into the passage that provides the basis for all of his instruction in chapter 2, 1 through 10, right? And I want to ask you to stand with me, if you will. This is the passage that we have put out as something to encourage you to memorize, right, over this uh, 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 little series. And I'm going to tell you one thing that I do, uh, and Rana can back me up on this. We, We often walk together and pray. Uh, and one of the things that I have been doing this week in particular and over the, the course of this series is I've been praying together through this passage. And my prayer will go things like this, Lord, you have come and you have offered salvation to all people. Lord, you have, you have, you have done that and your salvation teaches us to say no to a life that decenters you today. And Lord, please help me to put you at the center of my life today. Lord, help me to remember that, right, VBS, that you rule that you're God and I'm not. Help me, Lord, to remind, remind me of the fact that I was desperate and lost and you came and saved me and I couldn't save myself. I'm wholly dependent upon you. And Lord, you told me to say yes to a life with you at the center. And Lord, we're waiting for you to return and everything we long for is yet, so help me not to put my hope on everything today. All right, so that's the kind of thing here. So let's read this together. Uh, and I want to encourage you to memorize it and, and not only memorize it, but get to the point where you can walk your way through it with understanding. Okay, so let's read it together. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. May God add his blessing in the reading of his word. Please be seated. Now, what we find here then And this passage, and if you have your notes here and you want to write down some things here, some of your first blanks to fill in if you're doing that. But this this, uh, passage here is going to give us the reason why Paul says we should be the kind of people that we are in verses 1 through 10. So why should older men, as he says here, older men should be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and endurance... Well, why should they be those kinds of men? Older women should be reverent in the way they live. And then he spells out what it means to be reverent or God-honoring for women. And then young men and young women. Well, why should we be those kinds of people? Well, this is the passage that's giving the reason why. right? And this is true of Paul always and true of Scripture always. Scripture is never merely trying to manage your outward behavior. It's trying to transform you from the heart. And it's taking you back to what God did in Christ to make you new and to encourage you to live into this new reality, right? So it's not calling you to be something you're not. It's not merely telling you to dress up on the outside so that you look good on the outside or, or find some way to manage your anger by, you know, finding a pillow and going and screaming in it somewhere, right? You know, it's dealing with the fact of the anger that's in your heart. It's dealing with the greed in your heart. It's dealing with the desire to elevate yourself and put yourself at the center of everything. It's dealing with those things because he's going to say the old chains that used to bind you to a sinful life to live out your own sinful desires, they've been broken. And matter of fact, you've been changed. So this is the new kind of changed life that he wants us to live. So God has gloriously, the reason why we're to live as people that he calls us to live is God has gloriously displayed his loving favor. That's the way to describe his grace. His loving favor in Christ to reclaim and restore a people for their blessing and his glory. 
to reclaim and restore, to redeem, right, and to wash, right? Those are the things that he's done. And as he's done that, he's made this life possible, and it's also the reason why he compels us to be that, right? For our own blessing and for his glory, and we might add for this, so that we can display to the world the reality of what God wants to do in the lives of people who are caught up and dead to sin. That's what he wants to do. He wants to put us on display as people who are his very own, right? Eager to do what is good. So the issue here is the issues that he's laying out here are ways for us to live and notice in this present age. And that's language that the scripture uses to say the period of time in between Christ's and first, uh, second coming. In this age is the period of time between Christ's first coming and his second coming. The future is the age to come, right? And so these are instructions for how to live now, how to live today. And so what kind of woman should you be today? Well, we need to look here. What kind of man should you be? We need to look here, right? And again, this is a church that's right at the very beginning. And this is a radical change for the people in this culture because they're used to, they're, they're given to falsehood. They're given to lying. They're given to cheating. They're given to think that uh, a power is the most important thing exercised over other people. They're used to exploiting other people sexually. They're used to uh, behaving in ways that whatever feels good to them, they do. Whatever they can get away with, they're going to go after. Well, this is a radical sea change to say, no, you need to bring your desires under the control of what God has recreated you to become. And so your desires need not be just stuck out here or there, you need to bring them under his control. And this is a radical sea change. And this is a radical message in a culture that over and over again, I say this to the adults, that is characterized, as many people have called it, by expressive individualism. And that's just a term for who you are as whatever you think you are. And what you need to do in your life is spend time trying to get inside of yourself and thinking about who you are and trying to bring that out. And your biology doesn't tell you anything about who you are. God doesn't tell you anything about who you are. Your friends and family can't tell you anything about who you are. Even a sonogram when you're born can't tell you anything about who you are. Other than that you used to have certain biological equipment, right? So as you come into life, your whole goal is to, to go inside yourself and figure out who you are. And then come out with whoever you are. And the job of everybody else because they're expressive individuals too, is just to affirm whoever you are. Great. I'm glad you're that person. Right? And so it's stepping away from any sort of norms that there's anything that a woman should be or that a man should be or that there's any even such a thing as a man or a woman. And so in our own culture at this point in time, to step in and say, no, 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 there are boundaries that even to look at your gender as an assignment from God, that you were born as a man or a woman, and that puts certain potential into your life and certain parameters around it. And matter of fact, to actually enjoy life is to accept those and to live into those and embrace them. Right? So that's the kind of idea that's here. It's as radical today as it was then, right, to think about that. Okay, so the idea here is this is what we're after. Now, here's what he's going to say then. He's going to go after negatively first, then he's going to come back positively. Well, then what happens, right? Well, this salvation breaks, this grace, and this is something here. Uh, this, this, when, you, when you understand grace, grace is not a license to do anything you want, right? This is the old uh, uh, stupid understanding of grace is that, okay, I'm saved and now God has forgiven me and I'm secure with him and now I can do anything I want. Well, that's somebody who doesn't understand grace at all. Grace is God's power that comes toward you to change you and it's taking you in a direction. And if you've been saved by grace, then you have this power of God at work in you that wants you to say no to an old way of life, Right? It's not something that says, oh, now I got fire insurance and I can do whatever I want and God has to forgive me because that's his job. No, no. The grace of God every day is telling you to turn to him. The grace of God is pointing you to pray. The grace of God is pointing you to scripture. The grace of God is pointing you to the people of God to be around them. The grace of God is reminding you of your sin because to be in that sin is to darken your life, to make you someone who brings darkness into other people's lives. And so God is going to convict you of sin and say, hey, 
Matt, turn around. Matt, I love you. Don't keep walking in that way. Matt, go say you're sorry to Stephanie, right? Which has never happened, but just in case, right? All, all those kind of things that happen, the grace of God is moving you into the life that he's given you. And you should expect the fact that as you're pursuing God, he will not leave you alone. And if you turn back to that old addiction, you're not going to feel good about it. And it's going to take you back into that darkness. He's going to say, don't run there, run to me. Run to my people. I don't run there. All, all those types of things. So it's a grace that it's going to teach us to say no to a life that ignores or mocks God. Right? This is what he says here when he says, for the grace of God has appeared, offering salvation, teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Right? This is a lack of reverence for God, a lack of devotion to God. So this is the idea where God is just removed from the center of your life. Okay? And so this, this comes at least in two ways, sometimes explicitly, right? You have atheists who say, I don't need a God at all. So I'm going to take God out of my, and I'm going to figure out it on my own. But it also happens even among Christians where we try to make God into something that he isn't so that we can manage him, right? Or so that we can tell him what to do, right? Or so that he becomes the one who affirms whatever we want, Right? And so we've done the same thing. We just, put, we just tried to, you know, put handcuffs on God and tried to reshape him and say, and then we dictate to him terms, God, you're a good God if you do this for me. God, you're a good God if you take this out of my life. God, you're a good God if, if, if you know, I'm healthy, wealthy, and wise. And God says, no, I'm a good God if I save you from sin and bring you to life. And that's what I'm doing. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to work so deep and so hard that I want to transform you from the inside out because every inch of you needs to be reclaimed for me. Right? Every inch, every thought, right? Every use of your body, all of your money, right? I want to bring you to life so you don't have little compartments where you invite me in and then you keep me out of these, right? Or you say, okay, God, I, I turn my life over to you except for this. No, no, no. He comes in and he says no to pushing him to the side, right? And no to thinking that I can live my life. I, I pray this for myself. Pray that, Lord, help me. Because in the mundane things of life, all of a sudden God's just forgotten, right? Even today when I got up, I told this to the group when I was sitting there. Today, right, is a beautiful day. It's not hard to have a smile on your face when you walk out. I mean, this, I'll say for myself, there's no humidity, amen. No humidity. It's like in the 70s. We've got the windows open at the house. For my wife, this is a double amen because she can turn the air conditioning off, right? Amen, right? So her, her, her financial side of herself is just thinking, this is great. Thank you, God, right? So I do all those kind of things like that. It's a beautiful day. I love to be in it. But underneath all of that, the reason why this day is truly rich and truly wonderful is underneath all of that is Christ has saved me. And if my, if, my, if my good days are dependent on the weather, well, I'm in for a rough month in August. I'm in for a rough month, man. I mean, August is the hot, humid, dog days, that kind of stuff like that. It's not my favorite days, right? And if, I'm, if, my, if my, my day goes like this on the weather, but without Jesus, your days goes like this, whatever it is that's the best thing that you think in your life. But underneath, if Christ is there and he has truly saved you from everything that threatens you, he's truly given you everything that you long for and he promises to bring you into everything that you long for and were created for, well, even the worst day can be faced. And the best day is richer, right? So the idea here is I don't want to have God on the margins of my life. So it's no to that kind of life. And then if you push God right out of the center of your life, to God, well, then you're going to turn to worldly desires. You're going to turn to uh, your desires without God shaping and informing the way you feel, right? So your desires for a partner or for another person, right? Your desires for companionship will get distorted. And you'll want to use them. You'll want to be the center. You'll want them to be all about you. You'll put all of your hopes and trust in them. And they'll ultimately fail you or you'll crush them under the weight of the expectations. Because you need to rest in Christ as the one who can provide for you so that you can continue to love the people in your life even when they don't deserve it. And your life doesn't fall apart when they don't do their part. Right? So you'll turn to some other value system. You'll look to money or success or popularity right, to find what you think you're looking for in life. Right? 
You look for a set of circumstances, okay? You, you, you're made to worship, you're made to live on purpose, and if you throw God out of the center of your life, something will come in the vacuum. Something will come in the vacuum. It won't just be empty, and it'll be you behind whatever you choose. It'll be you as the wizard behind the curtain, right? So it says no to that, and then it says, on the other hand, trains us to say yes. Let me move forward here, one. Yes, it trains us to say yes to desires that are controlled by God's truth, right? Now, this, this is, there's so many things here. There's a thing we could talk about here, and I don't have time to do that, but it's not only tells you what you should love and what you shouldn't love, right? And one of the things that God's doing is he's transforming you so that you come to appreciate different things and you come to not like other things, right? There may have been jokes in the past that you were thought funny, but as you pass them through the grid of God's word, they don't sound funny anymore. There may be lifestyles where you thought it was great to go out and get hammered on the weekend and you used to celebrate that with your friends and now you realize that that's really sinful and self-indulgent. As a matter of fact, it opened me up to all kinds of things and I became a person really that hurt other people and I missed out on life. And now you look at it and you say, I'm not doing that again. I just don't have that desire anymore, right? Maybe you were a person who when, when people came in your life, you just tried to bully them, manipulate them, right? coerce them. Maybe you did it through passive aggressive behavior. Sometimes you were out and out. Sometimes you did it through abandoning them and walking away from them. You used to be that. Now you, you feel that that's wrong. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't express my anger that way. And matter of fact, it's not only that I changed what I'm angry at or what I love, but the degree to which I do it, right? One of the things that happen as you grow in Christ is that it's not only that your desires change and they get expressed differently, but they're apportioned according to the importance of the thing from God's perspective, right? If somebody walks in on Sunday morning and, you know, you've always sat in the same seat, right? I'm trying to pick out somebody. The Dunstans have always sat in the same area right there, right? Now, it's not their seat. They don't have their name on it anywhere. I do think that Don came in and carved his name in the bottom. But, you know, if you come in there, they, they sit here basically in the same area. But if Don came in and all of a sudden there was uh, uh, Larry Strong, you know, strongly sitting in his seat, right? And Larry and Susan had said, we're just going to mix things up this morning. So they came over there and they sat in the Dunstan seat. Well, if, if Don came in and all of a sudden his countenance changed, right, and he got angry and then he walked over to me at the pastor and he said, you know, Greg, you got to do something. The Strongs are sitting in my seat. And I said, well, what do you want me to do, Don? Go throw them out. So Don say that, right? Now, Don has never done that recently, but no, I'm just kidding. He's never done that at all. He's never done that at all. I'm just teasing with him. But, you know, the thing is, is somebody would say, well, man, there's something really wrong with that man because he's waiting something that's really insignificant as if it was really important, right? And as God trains us, notice these terms, he trains us, we come to wait what is important, what God waits is important, Right? And so we walk into this church, and there's a lot of crazy things that go on, but what's the most important thing is that we're called to love each other to Jesus as Jesus. What should be the most important thing? I, I want to walk out of here thinking, God, did I represent you well to my brothers and sisters today? Did I love them well? Not did I get my way, not, you know, kids, if you come in with the right snacks on the table, right? Right? No, but I loved my brothers and sisters here. I came and I was paying attention to them because the most important thing here is that God wants to bring them to himself and grow them in Christ. God, forgive me if I elevate the, the setting over the people. God, help me if I elevate the aesthetics over his mission. God, help me if I elevate my preferences about the songs over what the songs are about and what God wants to do in my heart, right? Right? So it, it controls our desires, and it sets the standard for what living right is, right? So live uprightly. Well, what does it mean for me to live in a right way? Well, God sets the standard for that. It means how I treat my neighbor, how I speak about them, how I, how I spend my money, right? What I value, all those things, he sets the standard. The world doesn't set the standard. The world doesn't set the standard for value, about what constitutes value. I don't have to look a certain way. Right? I don't have to have certain abilities. 
I don't have to have, you know, uh, real attractiveness on Instagram. I don't have to have perfect kids, right? I don't have to have all these things. What I do need is I need to walk with Jesus, know Jesus. I need that. That's what's important. And what I want to do today, at the end of the day, it's not important how many people like me. It really is important what Jesus thinks of my day to day. That's really important. At the end of the day, if I have pleased Christ, I have lived the best life for everyone in my life. If I have tried to please everyone in my life, I may have actually hurt them in the process. Right? So, yes, and then yes to a life that puts God at the center. And this is where he says here that we live godly lives, right? Where God and his truth shapes who we are. And so then the issue here then that he moves from there is there's one last thing that it trains us. It trains us to look forward, all right? Uh, in, a, in a culture, right, where we're, we want immediate satisfaction for everything, um, where a culture of pornography that, that, doesn't e- that doesn't want us to restrain our desires even within our marriages or within our dating relationships. No, 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 go ahead and give reign to them in every area, right? Don't restrain them to the boundaries that I've given for that, right? It trains us to wait. It trains us to realize that everything that we truly long for will not be had in the present, right? I, I was... Uh, uh, and, and again, we, we lose sight of this, but um, sadly, um, Dorcas uh, Hilliard, just within, uh, how long has it been, Dorcas, three, three weeks? Yeah, just within the last three weeks has lost both her mom and her dad. And it's just been a dark, heavy time. Loved her mom and dad, praised the Lord, they knew Jesus, they're with him, right? That's the, the hope, right, in our grieving, but but. If you, if, you, if you think that everything to be had now, then, then you just haven't been to a funeral lately. You just haven't been to a hospital lately, right? You're not being honest about the nature of life in this moment. And so it sets our expectations. We don't live, right, dour. We're not Eeyores, right? But the thing is, I know that no matter the amount of money that I have is going to make me truly happy. The perfect partner is not really what I need. And it's not truly going to satisfy me. The best job in the world is not truly going to scratch the deepest itch that I have. It's not going to happen until Christ comes back and writes everything. Right? And so I'm going to live up until that time over against darkness within me and darkness around me. And so I don't get discouraged when I find it. I don't get surprised. I'm not naive about it. So it sets my expectations. And it focuses my life. I'm living for beyond. Right? Life is short, eternity is long. Life is short, eternity is long. It puts perspective on my suffering. No matter what suffering that I'm in, it's a light and momentary compared to the payoff. Right? So I'm I'm enduring, right? Because it's not hopeless. It's not meaningless. It's not endless. Right? So the idea, it, it focuses life and it sustains service and worship. Right? The, right behind this is if Christ came to reclaim you and save you, you belong to him. And I don't know if you just want to set in. Sometimes you just need to think, take a, a moment aside and just think about the phrase, a, per, a people of his very own. And the reason why that doesn't rattle us is because we need to be taken by his spirit into who we were and who Christ is, and what it meant for him to make us his own. And then that he set his love on us, we belong. If everyone turns for me, I belong to the one that I truly am made for. We belong. I don't need someone to have me. I've been had. And I have everything that I need, and everything that I truly fear has been taken out of my life. Everything that I long for is promised for him. What I need is more of him every day. And I, I know I've said this to you before, is that we as Christians, got it? Okay, is, is I don't need anything else for, from Christ is what I need is a deeper appreciation of what I already have. Right? I need a deeper appreciation of what I already have. And so it sustains my service and worship. Why do I worship? Christ is coming. 
right? Used to be, see that little phrase down there, maybe today? I had a man that I grew up with in, in uh, the church that, when I was a young man. And uh, every time I would see him, he would shake my hand or shake my dad's hand. And just before we would leave church, he would turn to me and he would say, Greg, maybe today. Maybe today. And I, when I was a little kid, I didn't really understand maybe today. I'd turn to my dad and say, what? What's happening today, right? But maybe today, maybe Christ is coming today. Maybe today. Maybe's the day that, that we're going to get there. But live in the hope of that, right, in terms of that. And so then the work of Christ makes this possible, that kind of life possible, because of why? He, Christ reclaimed us from our slavery to sin and made us his own. We're free. We're redeemed. Okay? Right now, today, right, some of you are saying, but I'm struggling with sin. Yes. Oops, i got to remember. I'm tethered. Uh, uh, we're struggling with sin, but you have, it has been, its power has been broken over you. You don't have to submit to it today. And you have resources in Christ to say no. One of the other things that I often pray, and, and, and this is a real struggle for me, is I pray, Lord, you say that your spirit is within me that I'm your temple. Lord, I, awaken me to the power of the Spirit today that has made me your own and has set my heart apart for you. Lord, I want to live into that truth today. I want to appropriate his power. I don't want to say no to him today. I want to say no to sin today, right? No to anger, no to lust, no to hatred, right? No to selfishness, no to pride, right? I want to say that today. When it shows up, and God, I need your help by the Spirit to recognize it when it shows up because I know some of it, I just do, and I'm happy with it. And he'd be confronted by it today, right? So the idea, he's, he's broken the chains so that I don't have to sin today. And then Christ restored what sin had marred. He changes who we are and gives us new abilities and passions and priorities, a new mission, right? To do things that are good, right? To serve him to draw people to Christ, to reflect Christ, to love people as Christ, right? Those are the things that God has made possible, right? So he doesn't ask us to do something we can't do. He asks us to do what we've been enabled to do. All right? Here. So quick checkup as we come to the end. Do we as individuals and as a church adorn the gospel by our relationships with one another? Let me just say one thing here. No, I've got to stay here. Say one thing. When you adorn the gospel, it doesn't mean that people who don't know Christ will look at your life and say it's beautiful. You follow me on that? They may look at your life and say, you are stupid. They may look at your life and say, why on earth are you hanging with that man? I wouldn't forgive him for that. What are you doing? Why, why are you standing back from these fun things? Why, why are you doing that? Why, why aren't you moving in with your boyfriend? Why not? Right? Why, why aren't you just doing whatever you want to do? That, that sounds so stupid. What, what Paul is talking about here is that we live in a way that reflects Jesus to people to adorn it for God's glory and our blessing and for the hope that it will fully portray accurately the nature of who God is and what he is doing. But it may be received, right, as Paul says, by some, it may be just an, oh, that's an ugly life because I reject your God and I reject him and I think I'm fine on my own and your life is not attractive to me at all. So if you're thinking that this is one of the things that Christians get twisted around, right, uh, you think that the naivete is that if we live fully for Christ, then all of a sudden the Cretan culture would stand up and say, oh, what great people they are. Now the Cretan culture is going to say, what a, what a crazy bunch of nutty people. Right? So the issue here is I, I want to live for Je the, the people in my life, and I know I've said this over and over again, what your husband needs, what your wife needs, what your friends need, what your kids need, what your employer needs, what your employees need. Right, what your neighbor needs is a you full of Jesus. A you full of Jesus. Somebody following him, praying to him, looking to him, responding to your failures as someone who serves him and you apologize and own them. They're looking for you to represent Jesus and point them to him and trust the spirit of God to take that truth and burrow it into their souls. They may not like you for it. They may leave you for it. They may turn their back on you for it. They just may think you're weird and crazy. 
They may try to twist your love and call you a hater. Right? All those kind of things like that. But God has stepped in in Christ and he has made me new and freed me from sin and promised me for everything. I'm going to serve him and the only way I can love my neighbor is to point them to him. Right? And so are we cooperating with God's grace so that we reflect what Jesus reclaimed us and restored us to be? As men or women, as young or old people, as authorities and ones under authority, are we those kinds of people, right, as we think? Now, we're going to turn our, our thoughts to communion here as the family of God and come gathering around. Uh, and just let me say a couple things here as we, as we get into communion. Um, we have an open community at Emmanuel, which means that even if you're not a member at Emmanuel, you're welcome to come to the table as long as you're a follower of Jesus Christ. We don't offer this table as something that our church does. Christ offers this table to all of his people. And it, it is a table that pictures our, our union with Christ, our relationship with him, the fact that we are his people. It reminds us that we are invited to, to enjoy the goodness of God because we have abandoned ourselves by God's loving favor, turned our lives over to him, and he has delivered us. And as we sang in the song, right, which is an echo of Psalm 23, his loving kindness and mercy are following, following us all the days of our lives. And so we're coming to celebrate that union that we have with Christ, that freedom that we've been, the chains of sin have been broken, and all the consequences of sin, it's judgment that comes to us. And we've been made new, and we want to live into that life, and we're coming to celebrate that. At the same time, we're being reminded that he did break the chains of sin, and that he did make us new, and he wants us to take a moment and evaluate whether or not we're living consistently with the life that he's made possible in Christ. So if you don't know Christ today, this is something you won't want to participate in, but we would love for you to by coming to know Christ, believing in him. But if you're a follower of Christ and you're here, you want to celebrate this, but it's a time for reflection. It's a time for celebration. I want to do that. And so I'm going to pause here at a moment and give us a time for reflection. And I, and I put some, some uh, questions up here today that relate to our sermon this morning for us to think about. Think about your marriages. Think about your relationships within the church. Think about your role as a mom or a dad or as a friend. And let's ask God to search our hearts and try us, see if there's anything within us that we need to turn from for our blessing, for his glory, and for our effectiveness for him. So let's bow our heads together, and let me pray, and then I'll give you a quiet time to reflect. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us today. We thank you for Jesus today. And uh, Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, I know that, that you're at work here. Lord, whenever uh, your word is opened, and your people gather, uh, Lord, you, you remind us that we're uh, a dwelling place, a place where you're present, a temple. And Lord, you're here among us. And Lord, you're at work in the mess of everything that, that this auditorium represents in the lives of the people and the relationships that are here. And Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you're the answer that steps in, Lord, to break the chains of sin that have uh, broken our lives and taken us down paths of destruction and regret. Thank you, Lord, that you're not only a God who frees us from sin and frees us from its consequences, but you're a God who makes us new and empowers us. Lord, I pray that as we pause and reflect, Lord, please would you by your spirit help us to recognize areas in our life that are out of sync with you and Maybe it's in the fact that we just haven't rejoiced in what you've done and what you are doing and what you will do. Maybe, Lord, it's uh, our relationships are broken and we, we need you to step into them. Lord, maybe we haven't been the man or the woman that we need to be. So Lord, help us today. Lord, cleanse us, change us. So Lord, as we pray, Lord, work among us in Christ's name. Amen.